robots, mechanical or otherwise synthetic humanoids, have thrilled the imagination since the days of ancient Greece. From the bronze giant Talos in Galatea, to the relatively more recent creations as Der Sandman's Olympia and the Steam Man of the Prairies, Western culture has been inundated with machines of great size and great complexity. Even the word robot comes from a Czech word meaning slave. However, Japan's love affair comes not from a barely remembered time or a romanticized view of progress, but something more horrifying and destructive. It may sound bizarre to think of, but after the end of the Second World War, the people of Japan were faced with a major question. What were they to do about progress? And while the easy answer for most Western audiences is, embrace it, there was a strong sentiment in Japan at the time to return to a more simple and traditional ideal. After all, if modernization, in this context meaning westernization, got them into this mess, then eschewing it would get them out of it. This mindset is extremely visible in the 1948 film Drunken Angel by Akira Kurosawa, starring Toshiro Mifune in the lead role. In the film, Takashi Shimura plays Dr. Sanada, who is treating a Yakuza member named Matsunaga, who is played by Mifune. Set in the middle of the American occupation, Matsunaga is stricken with tuberculosis and is instructed to dump all the nightlife and drinking that he did. This is all tied into westernization and specifically Americanization as Matsunaga is balancing on a knife's edge when we meet him and Kurosawa shows no fear in showing just how perilous continued westernization could be. Well, it's easy to write Kurosawa off in this case, let's examine carefully where this sentiment may have arisen from. Starting in 1868, Japan had opened its ports and was working on turning themselves into a modern nation with Western accoutrements. The Meiji government rapidly turned the rigid feudalistic society into a modern powerhouse and immediately took aim at its old enemy, Korea. Major Clemens Wilhelm Jakob Mackel, who helped to train the Japanese officer cadre, sued for war against what he claimed was a dagger at the heart of Japan. The beast of Japanese industry was hungry, and the Joseon dynasty was its first snack. By 1876, what was once a vassal state of the Qin Dynasty was now firmly in Japanese hands. China, weakened by two opium wars with the West, and critically unable to bring its military might to bear against the much smaller nation, found itself in a bitter war by 1894. The Japanese had thrown off the kid gloves, having taken the best from all comers, Prussian-style infantry and a British-style navy, and crushed their opponent with overwhelming force. By 1895, they owned Taiwan and Laodong province in China, but the game of conquest was not nearly over. 1905 saw the Russians, the gendarmes of Europe, unstoppable juggernauts, utterly annihilated all fronts by the Japanese Navy and not faring nearly so well on land. By 1910, Korea would be annexed entirely by Japanese forces. What a boon westernization had become to the Japanese. They defeated their old rivals in Korea, gave China a black eye, and devastated the Russians. This little upstart nation took out what was considered to be the premier fighting force in Europe at the time. What could possibly stand in their way? They entered Northeast China in 1931, and from there in 1937, the Japanese further invaded to kick off what flared up into World War II. But by the end of the war, it was a far different story. Everything had gone so terribly wrong, and the mighty war machine that had dominated East Asia was a smoldering ruin. The tide needed to be turned somehow. The strong anti-westernization sentiment that had permeated the older group of Japanese people, who had known the deprivation and sacrifice following the war effort, had enough traction that it very well could have left Japan floundering against modern nations once again. There was a culture war brewing in the face of this great defeat, and there was a hole that needed to be filled by progress and modernization. And lucky for the gearheads in the audience, it was, by the most unlikely of heroes, a young boy named Tobio. Or rather, his robot duplicate. You may know him better as Astro Boy. Created in 1952 after getting decked by a drunk American GI, Osama Tezuka created a world in which robots and humans could coexist. The technology base was also set high enough to demonstrate the capacity of humans to enjoy the boons of progress to a public that was still wary of it. And while Astro Boy's adventures were important in setting the stage, this series has kind of gotten off topic already. Astro Boy debuted in 1952 to great aplomb, 
but not long after, something else appeared on the scene. He was bigger than big, taller than tall, and his name was Tetsujin Niju Hachigo. Commonly known as Gigantor in the West, Tetsujin 28, as this series will call him, took the foundations that Astro Boy had set in the post-war era and planted its big metal feet on it. While Astro Boy focused more on how technology was something that could be harnessed for the good of people, Tetsujin 28 focused on making a statement about all technology. It was only as good as the person wielding it. Mitsutero Yokoyama, influenced by Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, knew that the monster itself was neither good nor evil, and made his machine controllable by anyone who possessed the radio control device. After all, an intelligent person knows that Frankenstein is not the name of the monster, but a wise person knows that Frankenstein is indeed the name of the monster. Tetsujin 28 is the 28th robot in a line set to attack the United States by remote control and provide the function of a super weapon that could break the back of the American forces, kind of like, oh, I don't know, a nuclear bomb. However, it all fell to bits and the project never came to fruition. The Iron Man project still went through far enough that our hero got built, but never enough to turn the tide as he was meant to. However, considering the good that Tetsujin 28 ended up doing for everyone, and specifically for this series, it probably turned out alright. Another very important aspect of the show is the young character, Shotaro Kaneda, the pilot, used heavily in quotes here because he's not actually inside of Tetsujin 28, is a mere lad of 12 in the original show. Between this and Astro Boy, the focus is clearly on the younger characters, usually paragons of incorruptible virtue. They're the ones who will save the world because everyone else, specifically the adults, don't have what it takes. This affords the younger protagonists a way to call out the adults on the inconsistencies and hypocrisies of the world. This also became a driving force in the Gundam series. It took nearly 10 years for both Astro Boy and Tetsujin 28 to hit the airwaves as the country rebuilt, but for these characters to have such a critical impact on the redeveloping nation speaks volumes to their efficacy. At its peak, Astro Boy was watched by roughly 40% of Japanese viewers who owned a television. Such big hits were they that they were picked up near immediately after airing Japan by the United States. So there we have it. That's how this whole mess got started. Astro Boy and Tetsujin 28 were the founding fathers of a genre that would keep rolling along for decades to come. But that's a story for another episode. Oh.